I don't know about my love. I don't know about my love anymore. All that I know is I'm falling, falling, falling. Might as well fall in. Thank you for the spontaneous visuals there. I'd like to introduce a wonderful human being. We've been working on The Voice. The Voice has amazing potential and she has some wonderful things to say. Professor Sophie Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Har Reeps one. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm on this side. Reeps one, everybody. Well, you, not, most, not many neuroscientists start their talks with beatboxing. And, and there's, there, is, there is a... If you go with me, bear with me. There is, there is a sound reason for this. So I'm interested in... Speech and language and communication, and I got into this whole area thinking that I was dealing with language, and now I'm not. I know I'm not. I'm having worked with Harry. I now realise I'm, I'm still dealing with music. When we speak, it is still music. So actually, to think about what Harry just did at all, what you need to think about is, in fact, that humans walk upright. So we can only do any of this because at some point in our evolution, we started walking around on our back legs, and this has had. And many different knock-on effects. We can do very specialised things with our hands, for example, because we freed them up. We don't need to walk around on them. But the other thing that it's done is it's freed up the human rib cage. And the human rib cage isn't something we normally think about very much in neuroscience. We're more interested, if I'm perfectly honest, in the head. Um, but actually, the rib cage is really interesting. You're all using it right now to stay alive. So if I was to put a breath belt on you, I would see this sort of movement of your chest going in and out. And that's you using the intercostal muscles and muscles between your ribs to pull your ribcage out, draw air into your lungs, and then relax back down, air goes back out. It's very important. It's keeping you alive. Don't stop doing it. But there's something else that we can do, and we can do solely because we walk upright, and that we've freed up our ribcage. We don't have to use our ribcage to support our weight. All other animals, ma mammals, chordates, need to use their forelimbs to support their weight. We don't have to, and this has set our ribcages free. And something else that we can do, and only humans can do, we have direct control over the intercostal muscles, such that we start, when we start talking or singing or beatboxing, we use these same muscles completely differently. So, for example, when I start talking, I take a breath in, and now I use those same intercostal muscles in a very different way. And what I'm doing here is I'm using the intercostal muscles to maintain a constant flow of air out through the larynx. And if I keep talking without taking another breath, you can hear my intercostal muscles start to have to work really, really hard, and in the end, I'll run out altogether. Now, that doesn't sound... You know, thank, thank you for Sophie. Thank you for that weird demonstration. But actually, to do that is... We takes as much neural control as it takes to move your fingers. That's how much fine control you have over this. And we can only talk or sing or beatbox at all because of this. Otherwise, we'd speak 
with every breath. And, and, and also, what this is doing is letting you do things like sing. So I'm going to show you this. What you're doing with that fine control of air, and this slightly alarming picture, is your voice box. It's your larynx. It's a structure that in evolution has evolved to stop things falling into your lungs. In humans and in many other animals, what we found is... So that's the position on the, on the right. That's it's open so you can breathe. Uh, what you can do is bring them together to stop things draw, dropping into your lungs. But also, if you breathe out through that, you can make a sound. And if we actually show this in action, this is a heroic man speaking with a small camera dropped down the back of his nose. What you see is, rather alarmingly, what's actually going on when you talk. I haven't had visitors in so long. What are you? I'm a voice box. Some people call me a larynx. See my two vocal cords moving apart and together as I talk? They come apart so that the air can get through them, and they come together to vibrate and make sound as I exhale. Let me show you. Now, what I need you to do is just get over the fact now that we've all got very small, pink, terrifyingly vagina-like aliens living in our throats. <laughs> And that's what's making a sound, okay? We've all got that. We can move past that. That's great. Now, what is, what is also really important to bear in mind is that's where music in voices comes from. That's how we speak sounds that have pitch and rhythm. So if I play you a recording of just the sound made at the larynx, you'll hear what I mean. Let's see if you can recognise what this very familiar tune, well, piece of speech is. <laughs> Anybody recognise that? Jack and Jill. Now, I would like to go on record here as I hope the first person to use nursery rhymes in a presentation at Wired. Um, but it's a very, you can recognise this because it's a very, very familiar piece of uh, you know, nursery rhyme, the doggerel that children learn. You're recognising it through the pitch and through the rhythm. And you're putting the pitch and rhythm in at the sound you make here by what you're doing with your ribcage. This is where music's coming from in the voice. You then add to this with sounds, shaping the sounds, up with your, what's called the supralaryngeal articulator. So your teeth, your tongue, your jaw, your soft palate. And in humans, this has evolved separately. So stuff happening at the larynx and the chest is letting us sing and put sounds that have rhythm. Separately, and much later, we seem to evolve changes up here that mean that we can shape the sound differently. And we've got these much flatter faces than other mammals, and our tongues are freed up and very nimble. And we've got these domed surface tops of our mouths. The roof of your mouth feels like a dome shape. It's flat in other animals. And this is giving you more complexity in how you can shape sounds. So if we can actually look at this working, I've now got some real-time MRI sequences. So we're driving a, a magnetic resonance imaging scanner as a video recorder to actually look at how you move your articulators. The first thing I'm going to show you is somebody laughing. Now, laughter is more like an animal call than it is like speech. And basically, it's got nothing to do with the supralaryngeal movements at all. And when you watch somebody laughing... Sorry, so this is the shaping that I'm talking about. So this phenomenal complexity, the nimbleness of the tongue, is, again, unique in nature. Only, animal, only humans can do these kinds of movements. So we look at something, a very simple sound. This is what laughter looks like. And you're not doing this at all. When you laugh, you're basically just having big spasms down at your rib cage. Nothing is occurring up in the supralaryngeal space. Compare this to speech. This next sequence is that somebody talking. This is me trying to use all of my articulators. So what you see there is just a phenomenal amount of movement. And that's what speech is. In addition to the terrifying stuff happening down at the larynx, you've got all these very rapid movements here. Now, I thought, and for many years, I would start all my talks by saying, this is, behold speech, behold the most complex sound in nature. No other animal can do this. We've evolved the ability to produce this amazing complexity. Um, and then I met beatboxers. I met Harry. I met Reaps One, who you saw before. And I realised that we are nowhere near starting to approach the complexity of what you can actually do with these articulators. So, for example, in traditional phonetics, we're taught that to speak, we make one sound in our vocal tract, and then, then we sort of shape that, but there's only one source of sound. Now, that's, what, that's the dogma. That says that's what we can do. Reaps One, who you saw before, he can set up a sound at his larynx, so he make that sound with the terrifying alien in his throat. He can simultaneously make a sound at his lips by blowing air out. I'm not going to try and do that because it will be undignified, but he does it very well. 
And he can make a third sound by producing nasal harmonics at the back of his nose. And he can independently vary all those pitches. Now, according to traditional phonetics, no one's able to do this, but nobody's told the beatboxers. So if we start looking at what this looks like using the same sequence of running the MRI machine as, as a video recorder, now compared to speech, this is what beatboxing looks like. So this is one of the first scans that we did with Reaps 1. Easy, this is Reaps 1, and check this out. So the next sequence that I've got is, the sound is slightly less good, but it's a much faster temporal sequence, so you get even more detail about the kind of movements that he's making. Start to wa watch the, the front of his tongue. He's going right back in his mouth. Just amazing. So, what I started to think working with beatboxers, working with Reaps One, was I realised not only is there tremendously great deal more complexity to what we can do, maybe we need to start rethinking our ability to speak at all. Because what we've done when trying to understand the evolution of the human voice is we've looked at humans who mostly talk to each other and we thought, how have they evolved to do that? They seem to have evolved this breath control and making a sound here and then they've evolved all this stuff up here and they use that for speaking. But actually, we could only speak once we'd got all that. We couldn't speak before then. So it's very hard to see what the mechanisms are that could have drawn, drawn, actually caused this to happen. And I'm starting to wonder if the clues might not actually lie in beatboxing and the sorts of skills that beatboxers have. And in terms of the brain control of speech, we've, tended to, we've thought about how people control their articulators by thinking about speech, because that's, you know, that's what we mostly do. And we've got quite a good idea about the networks involved. So we know the cerebellum, the little brain at the back of the cortex, that sort of kind of wrinkly little bit of walnut. That seems to be really important in coordination and timing in movements. You're using sound, the sounds that you make, to actually shape what you're doing with your voice. And you're doing similar things with the sensation of what's happening inside your mouth. If you've ever had a dental anaesthetic and you haven't been able to feel the movements of the, what your mouth feels like, you'll remember how hard it is to actually talk. And that's because you're using that information in real time to control speech production. And then you've got very detailed control in terms of motor output areas of how you're actually using those articulators. And again, this is specific to humans. Other animals can't do this. In fact, I saw a talk yesterday where somebody was saying squirrel monkeys cannot move their fingers independently. And we can do. Evolution has given us that. And I'm wondering if there's going to be something similar about our articulators. We've got this kind of, not just control, but independence of actually how we can separately use our articulators to make sounds. And then we've got brain areas at the front of the brain, which are really important in planning. And if you have lesions to these brain areas, you can still speak, but speech is extremely effortful and very difficult, and it seems to be difficult to actually put together the linguistic aspects. Finally, we get to something that looks a bit like language. So as part of trying to understand these networks, we scanned Reaps 1, um, and this is what it looks like in, in, in Reaps 1 brain when he is beatboxing that is more activated than speaking. So our baseline comparison here is him talking. A lot more activation in his brain when he is beatboxing than when he's speaking, which you would expect because he's doing, as you saw, so very much more when he is beatboxing. There is a tremendous amount of complexity. He's also got huge amounts of activation in the cerebellum, presumably because he's coordinating so much more. Interestingly, not much to do with planning. It's not a, it's not a linguistic skill, potentially. Now, just to see what this looks like in somebody who's not a beatboxer, we have data here from a novice beatboxer, which is definitely the politest thing anybody's ever called me. 
Um, we thought we need someone who's definitely never beatboxed. And I thought, well, do you know what? I have definitely never beatboxed. So this is me sort of going, I didn't even know about going boots and cats. I didn't have any clue. I did not have a clue about how to beatbox. And you can see that. This is me trying to beatbox. Brain activity that is greater than me speaking. And basically what I'm doing is I'm driving my speech production system harder. Because that's all I've got. That's all I know about how to use this thing. I've got, like a gl I've got no real expertise in being able to access all the rest of the possibilities of what's going on with the human voice. So I think the thing that I would just like to end with is, as I say, I think we've been looking at the wrong thing in the wrong way. We've approached the human voice as being about language, and we thought, is, did we evolve to speak because we've sort of the, the, the mechanisms have been about language? But maybe it's not. When I hear beatboxing, I hear like, ambition and skill and creativity and delight and hope and possibility. And actually, maybe that's what we've actually evolved with our voices. We're seeing in beatboxing like a glimpse of all the other stuff we can do with our voices. And maybe that's what's driven the evolution of this skill. It's more to do with exploring the possibilities of essentially what is our first musical instrument. We think it's about language, but actually you can think of the voice as being a fully-fledged musical instrument. And your first musical instrument, the first one you heard, the first one you ever learnt to play... Maybe that's what's driven it. Maybe we've been looking in the wrong place all along. Maybe by looking at beatboxing, we're not just looking at something amazing, but we're actually looking at something that's taking us right back to the evolutionary history of how we're able to do any of these things with our voices. Thank you very much.